share. When did you first go in the woods? Uh, March of 1962. 62. Right I was 15 years old. 15? How come you started so young? John Gurley kicked me out. <laughs> so you got kicked out of high school. Yeah, because I was never there. Was, yeah. I was always up in the bush with the 22 hunting uh, hooter grouse, eh? <laughs> okay. And then finally he said, if you don't want to come to school anymore, kid, don't, don't come. Okay. So then I had to go home and tell my parents. And the old man said, well, you're not sitting around here. He said, you better go down to the trading company, get yourself a pair of boots and get a job. So uh, down to see uh, uh, Daryl Rogers, and he got me a pair of boots, my first pair of boots. And um, Rick Curley got me a job working over in the West Coast at Morton Whittington Logging. And I started okay. out blowing whistles in. Okay. Whistle punk. So what actually is a whistle punk? Well, you got to have whistles to make the, the rigging move up and down and whatever. And in those days, before they had the electronic whistle, they had cords, just like uh, uh, extension cords. Yeah. And you had that wrapped around your neck about 500 times. <laughs> and then as you went out, you just kept putting it out, and then you blew the whistle. So as the rigging's coming out, the rigging swinger would haul, hey! Like that, you blow one, it stopped. And then they'd go in and separate the chokers, and then they'd say, slack her down! And then you blow a bunch of shorts. Slack it down. Then they'd set the chokers, and then they'd say, go ahead. And you both beep, 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 three to go ahead. Then the turn So went. this was a way of communicating. And to with the, the yarder. So the yarder guy knew exactly what you wanted to do, eh? Well, that sounds like a very responsible job. If you did something wrong, you could kill Oh, yeah, you killed the whole crew. Yeah, I almost killed Rick Curley, actually, one time. He was bucking the log, and I the turn was going in, and I was watching it. And I figured he's, you know... And uh, finally, the loader blew the whistle, and the yarder stopped. And then he hollered to me, why didn't you stop? Well, I said, the yarder guy could see you, and I can see you. Why didn't he stop? But he kept going, and it would have run the turn right over him. So the signals were one to stop? In the old days, it was one to stop, one to go, and that's how they killed so many in the 30s and 40s. Okay. And then somebody got the bright idea, well, let's have three to go and one to stop. Okay. And two to come back, and three to go ahead. So when you were working in the West Coast, were you on uh, pretty steep slopes? Yeah, but a huge cedars. Probably the size of this room. Tremendous cedars, eh? It was knitting that lake is where we were at. Uh, an old logger told me one time, loggers are the smartest people on earth. For the simple reason is, you give them some cable, a winch, and some power behind it, and they can move just about anything by putting blocks on it. You take any average guy that comes off the street and put him in it and try to get him to move, couldn't move those in a hundred years. And some of those guys were fantastic in, in mentality and how they learned how to move some of that stuff. Well, how did you guys learn? Like, we well, just learned from education? an older guy, okay. uh, older guys. As it started out here, uh, a lot of thin people came to Ladysmith, as you well know. And at one time, a lot of Italians and stuff come to the mind. Well, the Finns came here because they used to be riggers on the sailing ships. And they had the masts, so they knew all about that rigging. They were rigging all the time. So when they come in, maybe they're on a ship, they come into Ladysmith Harbor to get coal. And somebody said, how much uh, are you making? Oh, I make uh, $20 a month. Come to the woods and we'll pay you 200 a month for doing the same thing. So they just jump ship and go to work at Copper Canyon or Nanaimo Lakes. And a lot of the old timers that I work with were all old thin guys. Eh? Some of them could hardly speak English, but they knew their business when it come to rigging and, and stuff like that. Eh? Climbing trees and going up those. I had lots of chances. You want to get in the pass chain, kid, and go up the tree? Not for me, partner. I ain't going up there. Thank you very much. I'll stay on the ground. Well, I worked in Ima River, Copper Canyon, and then when I worked for Comox, I worked at Nitnat, Nit and uh, Nanaimo Lakes. But the trouble is with Nanaimo Lakes, they had so much seniority, you get laid off at the end of September or October, you wouldn't see another work until, uh, you know, March or April. So... Everybody there had 40 years. Nobody quit, so you never move up the ladder. So then I just left and went somewhere else. So you get a little experience, move to the next camp. Get a little more experience, move to the next camp, till you work your way up. I worked on a lot of tough shows actually, but uh, there was uh, 
There was one over there in uh, Nanaimo Lakes. They called it Suicide Bluff. Eh? More guys got hurt on that. I mean, it was just like that. But it was good timber growing off it for some reason. My brother worked on there. He never got hurt, but uh, some of them did. Eh? But, I mean, there was rocks rolling down and chunks, and you never knew what was coming. Eh? Mm. You might be down here, and some chunk comes from way from the back end. Well, you know, you don't stand a chance. Mm -hmm. I had a few close calls when I worked on the rigging, too. But a lot of it was cockiness and young and don't want to get out of the way. If you don't get out of the way, you're going to catch one. Did you one, get hurt? Did you? No, I never did. No, I was very, very lucky. And I was fast enough to be able to get out of the way. And I didn't go to work drunk or I didn't go to work stoned because I figured I needed all my faculties when I was out there because there was enough hazards that there was. I mean, I injured and sprained an ankle and pulled a muscle or two, but... Mm. But no, not like some guys. They really got, a lot of guys got smashed, boy. Well, I know a guy that he, he got a log rolled, uh, well, he was standing by the truck, and this log rolled down the bank, a small log, and he didn't, he had a pickup truck there, a company, and he didn't want it to hit the truck and put a dent in it, so he put his foot up to stop it, eh? And it just rolled right up his leg and went, snap, 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 snap. God, yeah, and, uh. Oh, lots of power saw cuts. Guys are always cutting themselves or getting kickbacks and power saws. But the old power saws, they were gear driven, eh? Not like the new ones. And these, these are all direct drive, eh? But those gear drive, I remember my dad, he was a faller. He come home, I can remember his legs sometimes from, from here to his ankle would be black and blue from the saw kicking back, eh? Well, it would hit and then it would turn black all the way down, eh? And uh, you always had to use your your hand or your uh, use your knee to support the, the saw because there were big saws in those days eh, with that big timber mm -hmm. and I remember in his one knee his left knee he had about five um, scars across it from mm -hmm. saws kicking back and over his knee eh? and then now they got all padded uh, pants and everything uh, there at Kelsey Bay at that time too when I was working at Eve River he went to work drunk and there was uh, two windfalls like this and there was a tree going up through the middle and he instead of what he should have done is bucked all four windfalls yeah. first and he didn't no. he just figured he'd go in there and he'd mm -hmm. fall it and it would flip over well it fell all right and yeah. pinned him right in there and killed him when you go to fall and that thing drops out of there and it hits you and then you're you made your wife a widow. Yeah. And that's basically what a widow maker is. It couldn't be a broken off chunk or it couldn't be uh, just a limb. And uh, when you're falling, that's the first thing. And I did some falling, but not a lot. First thing you do is you make sure you look up and check that tree up really good to make sure there's nothing hanging up there that's broke off that's going to come down and get you. What about barber chair? Barber chair is another one because you, uh, if it's got too heavy of a lean on it and you cut it, and instead of cutting it properly, it's got too much strain on it. It just looks like a chair. It breaks off and then splinters up high, and then it comes up like this and kicks over. It can kick back onto you at the same It time? could be, uh, but most of the time it doesn't. It, it's like the back of a chair. Okay. The back of it. And what other things are real dangers when you're falling? Well, mostly it's limbs and, and not clearing a pathway to get out of the way and get out of there, don't stand at the tree stump. As it starts to go, get out of there, because whatever is coming, it's coming right where you're standing. So as soon as that tree starts to go, if you watch anything about falling, you shut your saw off and get out of there, because if something breaks off, or a piece of bark comes down, or, a, you know, I mean a robin's egg falling from 70 feet in the air put an awful dent in your hard hat. What were the other dangers that you would really face in other aspects of the woods, when you're rigging, when you're in the uh, rocks landings. falling down, uh, whatever. I know uh, guys um, up at a camp I worked in. So you rocks falling down. Uh, uh, rock, well, rocks moving because it's all uneven glacial ground. Eh, with trees, I don't know how the trees even grow on there, but I guess because of the glacier, it's good material. Eh? But the trees growing up through the rocks, so then they're going in and they're falling them. Well, then when you got to yard them out, 
that rocks, they're always moving because they're like a slide. One time we were in Tobin Inlet and uh, the boss came up and I was running the grapple yarder and he wanted to stop me and they had to sign these forms that you knew what your job was, a safety job safety breakdown they call it. So anyway, um, I stopped the yarding and we were logging and do you know what a snow chute is? No. Like it goes right up the top of a mountain in a V and all the snow was packed okay. in there over the winter eh? and it probably 40 feet deep, 50 feet deep in there. Well, then in the spring, it's thawing, eh? and pieces of junk are falling down there. And you never, and rocks come down there sometimes. But anyway, the foreman came up, and he gave me these papers, and I signed them, and my crew signed them. And then he said, okay, I'm going to get out of here. So he drove down past, we started right on the edge of the snow chute to log. Well, he went down past the snow chute and sat down there. And all of a sudden, he, I heard him, I started the yard, and I heard him say, did you see that? And I looked over my right shoulder, and there was a rock the size of this house. Came down, bouncing down that snow chute, hit the culvert, went right over top of his pickup, and went down below. Now, if that would have hit him, it would have been just like stepping on a yeah. wood bug. Eh? Yeah. And he came out of there, and he was just as white as a sheet. Mm -hmm. But it just wasn't his day to go. Yeah. Now you talked about a lot of different uh, nationalities working in the woods. Uh, you say there was Finns and Italians. And Swedes. Swedes were the fallers. Uh, Finns were the riggers. Um, yeah, there was different. Were there many First Nations? Yeah, they worked in there too. A lot of them. They were mostly rigging guys. But I knew a guy. Uh, a couple of crack the canyon were log loader operators. When did you start seeing women coming yeah, in? In the middle 60s, late 60s, they started, uh, especially Crown Zellerbach had some of their uh, the superintendent's daughters were working there. I can't remember their names now. What were they doing? Flunky. Yeah, they were helping in the cookhouse. Cookhouse. Yeah, yeah, they were putting out the food and doing did the it, dishes. And did they only worked in the woods? Uh, it was a few, but they they kind of ruined it for other women because they weren't doing the job. They just don't have the upper body strength to do the rigging. Now, I'm not saying a woman couldn't run a log loader or drive a log loader, yeah. which they do. They're doing that today. Yeah. But in those days, to get up there, you have to go all those different steps. Yeah. you got to start as a chokerman and then a chaser. And, and I've seen a woman in the landing, you know, doing the chasing and stuff like that. But, I mean, you got to be on that saw steady, and uh, when you put the saw down, you're unhooking chokers, and from there you're hooking up trailer, and then you're stamping logs or maybe painting them too, and, and you're doing the splicing of the wires. and it's pissing down rain. And pissing down rain, rain and snow, and what woman would want to be out there? Some of them did, uh, but there wasn't that many. So you're 40-plus years working <clears throat> in the woods. What made it really interesting for you? What what was it that kept you in the industry? Because you money. said you said yeah. money. I made lots of money. I made more money there than I could have made anywhere else with that money. I mean, I had a grade eight education. Where yeah. the hell could I go? I mean, it was either Shimano Sawmill, and I didn't <coughs> like that much. I liked the woods because I had all summer off because it was usually fire season, and I had all winter off because there was so much snow. So you you know you got the summer and winter off, and then you worked the spring and the fall, and you made good money. I made enough in six months, three months in the spring, three months in the fall to pretty well do me for the next winter. That's something that I remember as a kid, it, being laid off for summer, fair season, and snow. You don't hear that anymore. Yeah, they do, but uh, they uh, they're in second growth now too, and they, a lot of it's uh, what they call uh, mechanical. There's no falling or anything like, well, they're falling, but they yeah. got But it's all done with machinery, so there's not cables. The cables are running on the logs. That's what causes your fires. Okay. You know, in the wintertime, or in the, at nighttime, we used to log at night, you look at those blocks where the cables are run through. There's sparks coming out from both sides of them block, blocks, five feet. Right. So you can, they're coming out in the daytime, too, but you can't see it. You never do well, that. If, yeah. Oh, the sparks come out of there just like you're using a, a an angle grinder on a piece of steel because mm. it's steel on steel, eh? Mm. Or you see through the night 
the line slot together and there'll just be a shower of sparks go up the cables. You can see that at night time when you're working night yeah, shift. I remember the cables slopping. Yeah, slopping together, yeah. yeah, yeah. I loved that uh, night shift logging. That was more fun than anything. <laughs> Bats flying in and out of the lights and uh, owls flying by. and Oh, well, we had a good time out there. We got more logs on night shift than they did on day shift. And then they come in a day shift. They had lots of logs ready to load in the morning. I was the oldest guy on the crew when I was 21, <laughs> running the yarder, and there was I had a 19-year-old chaser and a 19-year-old uh, hook tender. You said you were there for the money. Yeah. That did you have any other reasons? Well, it to was be fun to do it when we were young, starting out. Eh? I mean, you've got lots of energy, and and you like to get logs, and you could brag to everybody in the bar and how many loads you got and how many logs you got. And, and, uh, you know, it was lots of fun and camaraderie of the guys. It was just amazing, some of the guys, some of the stories. Mm -hmm.